And we're live in five, four, four three, two, one. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Kaffis. I'm one of the cerebrovascular fellows here at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our biweekly cerebrovascular uh, Q&A hosted by the Seattle Science Foundation. It is really our honor and privilege to have with us an internationally renowned expert in our field uh, this morning, Dr. Michael Lawton. Uh, Dr. Lawton has either directly or indirectly influenced many of the practicing cerebrovascular neurosurgeons, both in our country as well as across the world. Um, he's someone who certainly does not need an introduction, uh, but I'll remind everyone that he's the chairman of neurosurgery at the busiest cerebrovascular center in the country, the Barrow Neurological Institute. He's also the president, CEO, and Robert Spetzler Endowed Chair of Neurosciences at the Barrow. He is uh, renowned for his microsurgical skill and innovation in treating cerebrovascular and skull-based pathology. And he has particular expertise in uh, the treatment of aneurysms, AVMs, cavernous malformations, as well as revascularization surgery. Um, his academic achievements are tremendous, over 500 peer-reviewed articles, 70 book chapters, over 800 invited lectures. Uh, the list goes on and on. Um, he's very passionate about maintaining and passing along the open cerebrovascular skill set uh, to others in our field. His textbooks, uh, seven aneurysms, seven AVMs, seven bypasses, for myself and countless others have become the premier text that we use to, to learn these difficult surgeries. Um, we're honored to have him here. Uh, he's going to be discussing a challenging topic, uh, brainstem cavernous malformations with us today, and hopefully demystifying the way uh, to approach these difficult lesions. Um, so with that, you know, Dr. Lawton, thank you very much for joining us today, and please go ahead. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm sharing my screen and hopefully uh, you can now see my title slide. Looks great. Okay, good. Well, um, yeah, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, and uh, uh, I think um, I'll try and get into 30 minutes here um, or less. Um, a summary of the next book in the series, uh, what I'm calling Seven Cavernomas. It um, uh, really, um, fits nicely in that uh, list of things um, that I've covered in the seven books from aneurysms, AVMs, bypasses, and now this. It's sort of like the fourth big um, piece of the um, surgical, uh, vascular surgical uh, pie. And uh, you know, I think um, there was some work that needed to be done here to pull it all together. Um, so hopefully a lot of you have seen some of these articles coming out in the Journal of Neurosurgery as a what we call the seven cavernomas collection. And the idea was to really um, put together a taxonomy that would help us make decisions as we make our management uh, choices for these patients and to develop some um, uh, what I call heuristics, which are just um, some little uh, rules of thumb to get you through some of these uh, decisions. So uh, let me just dive in. This is from an experience now with um, over 1,200 cavernous malformations, including over 400 in the brainstem, and not including those in the spinal cord. Um, the taxonomy as it lays out, um, as you might imagine, has seven types or categories. Um, and you can see the list here, starting in the cerebrum, going into the deep uh, cerebrum, the central core of the basal ganglia and the thalamus, then moving on to the brainstem with midbrain pons and medulla, and finally, uh, finishing with the cerebellum. Uh, the illustration you see to the right um, will become clear towards the end of the lecture, but it's um, it's a map of everything I'm gonna tell you uh, in this talk. And it just um, is meant to summarize um, a lot of the concepts and the way of thinking about this uh, disease. 
we talked a little bit about how fortunate I am to have incredible medical illustrators at the BNI, and this is one of their um, uh, products. This is a um, model of the brain, and it has all of the different subtypes in this taxonomy. There are 35 in total, and you can see um, no matter where you look in the brain, um, there's, a, there's a zone that's color-coded, and that corresponds to the subtypes. The, the types are the seven that I just laid out for you, and within each type is a subtype that um, is primarily based on the surface of the brain that the malformation presents to. And so um, it's that defining surface that we use in making our choices about surgical approach. So the combination of the region plus the surface is what defines a taxonomy. Um, and it's kind of like the animal kingdom in zoology. We have a species and a family. And with the, with the family and a species, we can pretty much understand or group an animal and understand um, where it comes from and who it's related to. And it's the, really the same here with the cavernous malformation. So let me just um, walk you through this. In the cerebrum, um, there are the four types, convexity, medial, basal, and sylvian. These are the four surfaces that you find in the cerebrum. And these define um, the four uh, subtypes in the cerebrum. And these are pictures showing the lateral convexity, the usual conventions of frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital apply and they, they help you kind of subcategorize that. But here, um, different views of the convexity surface. Here, the medial uh, surface is shown, the frontal, parietal, and occipital, um, as well as temporal, if you look deep through uh, on the other side of the brainstem. When we get to the basal, you'll notice that um, there are only three of these types because the parietal lobe does not have a basal surface. And the same is true with sylvian. There are only three subtypes here because they're... Um, uh, isn't an occipital sylvian surface. So um, these are the um, the four uh, convexity subtypes. And as we move along, um, next is the basal ganglia. Um, there's a caudate, putamen, and a palatal um, subtype for each of these. And this um, these nuclear divisions really nicely divide the basal ganglia into these three categories. And um, this is how I think about these lesions. These are just alternate views. Um, from front, back, and side, and so forth, of the different uh, nuclei that make up the basal ganglia. The thalamus gets more complicated. Um, it too has its nuclear divisions, which you may or may not remember from medical school. But um, what's uh, handy about the nuclear anatomy of the thalamus is that it really corresponds to some of the surgical choices that we make in our approaches. So for each of the different color codes, uh, we have a unique approach. And there's an anterior type in teal, a medial type in yellow. The biggest is the lateral group or the ventral nuclei uh, in red. And then in the back, you have uh, pulvinar uh, geniculate. And at the very top in green, you'll see this additional one, the choroidal, which is nice because when we come down through a transcolosal approach, you get right to that spot for the ones on the top. These are those nuclei uh, shown in a different perspective. Um, again, front, back, side, and inferior. And you can see how um, this um, uh, nuclear anatomy nicely breaks up the thalamus into these groups. The, uh, the brainstem moving on um, <clears throat> has uh, three types, midbrain, pons, and medulla. And again, with each of these, um, I think about the, the section of <clears throat> the brainstem in terms of its surfaces so that you've got an anterior surface in teal, you've got an anterolateral surface in red, a lateral surface in orange, posterior in purple, and then um, a uh, posterior lateral uh, in green. And you can see that um, for all the different uh, levels, um, these different zones help you think about where these lesions come to that surface. So um, this is just another view from Peter Lawrence's artwork uh, showing how you can think about um, these different sections or zones of the brainstem. And what's important is that um, with the taxonomy, what you're doing is you're taking your lesion based upon your MRI um, imaging and you're placing it into this map of the brain and it's defining for you that lesion. And once you have a definition of the lesion, it then leads you to your recommendations for your surgical approaches. This is kind of where this is going. Um, just more views. This is now going around to the back and the side showing the, um, the brainstem and um, 
You can see the quadrigeminal and tegmental uh, um, subtypes here in the midbrain. We've got an inf inferior peduncular and a rhomboid uh, pontine subtype here in the back. We've got a trigonal, which is the floor of the fourth ventricle below the stria medullaris in blue. We've got a gracile and a cuneate nucleus here uh, in green and orange. So again, um, you see all of the different uh, subtypes here laid out. And um, part of learning this taxonomy is just learning the, the adjectives to describe them. And here's just a table showing, you know, interpeduncular, peduncular, tegmental, and so forth for the midbrain. For the pons, we have a basilar, a peritrigeminal, middle and inferior peduncular, rhomboid, and a superolivary. And for the medulla, we have pyramidal, olivary, trigonal, gracile, and cuneate. So very anatomically based. Um, so it almost tells you uh, where you're going to uh, see the, the pathology. Uh, so it's really not that hard to remember. But um, again, learning the names is really all um, where this starts uh, in learning the ta taxonomy. The seventh and final uh, group is the cerebellar lesions. And there are five here. Um, Roten defined these three cerebellar surfaces, petrosal, tentorial, and suboccipital, and those are three of the six. Uh, but then um, there's an additional um, one here in the vermis in blue. Uh, there's a tonsillar one here in green. And then um, on this next slide, you'll see there's also a deep nuclear, which is the ones uh, that lie in and around the dentate nucleus uh, near uh, the dentate, or if you go medially, you've got your emboliform, globose, and vestigial nuclei uh, towards the center. So um, at the end of the day, um, uh, this slide is actually incorrect. There are 35, because um, the cerebrum are only counting four, but um, there are 35 um, different subtypes, and that's your taxonomy. Now, how does that help you? It helps you in a couple of different ways. The first that's interesting, um, I'm sure a lot of you can remember years and years ago in medical school learning all of those uh, classic stroke syndromes on your neurology rotation, um, well, those have become really antiquated in the MRI era. But when it comes to cavernous malformations, they're actually useful again because they help us define or validate our classification or our categorization. So what this slide is showing you is in the pons, you have a list of symptoms on the left, you have the different subtypes on the top, and each um, column has a slightly different uh, color pattern, which tells you that um, each subtype has its own unique clinical syndrome that defines it. And so um, just as an example, here's the super olivary subtype. It's one of my favorites. It sits in this underbelly of the pons, and it's accessible through a far lateral approach that reaches up and under that underbelly. And if you look at the clinical symptoms for this, they're, they're absolutely classic. Patients present with an ipsilateral uh, six nerve palsy. That's the most common of the findings, but they often have an ipsilateral facial nerve palsy if it's a little bit bigger and a little deeper. And you can see over here on the wiring diagram why that's so. Uh, when it sits in that location, it nails the abducens nerve at its exit zone. And it's also very near the facial nerve exit zone and uh, interparenchymal course of the nerve as it goes from its nucleus around the um, six nerve nucleus and out. So this explains the findings. This is what you see in your patients at the bedside, and it all fits together very nicely. Um, so it, it's a useful way, um, as Osler would say, to listen to your patients and let them tell you your diagnosis. So that's the, um, those are the, the comments about the stroke syndrome, but really the, the value of taxonomy, in my opinion, is this. It's, it will tell you the approach that you're gonna take to the lesion. And so, um, you know, when it comes to the cerebrum, it's maybe not as critical. For, for these, you can see from this illustration that um, when it's on the convexity, we're going to choose just um, a small mini craniotomy. We're going to go either transgyrally or transsulcally, and we're going to um, get directly to the lesion in the uh, easiest possible way. So it's not so critical there. But when it comes to your deeper structures, and I'm talking about basal ganglia, thalamus, and all of the brainstem types, uh, this is where it has value. When you look at these next illustrations, you see that there's so many ways to get to these deep targets. And uh, what I find interesting is that um, most of the time when people send me cases to review, they're, they're trying to figure out the best approach. And so what the taxonomy does is it tells you um, 
really my thoughts on the best approach. And because I did um, a lot of this uh, data acquisition with my data and with Dr. Spetzler's data, it also reflects his best uh, approaches too. So at least for, from the, the way the two of us think about these problems, um, it reflects that uh, way of thinking. So for the basal ganglia, you can see there were three types. We had a caudate uh, type here in, in teal, and that's gonna be approached through a contralateral transcolossal transventricular approach here with this vector through the bifrontal craniotomy. For the um, putaminal lesions in red, you can see we're gonna choose a transinsular, um, tr transsylvian transinsular approach here that's directly to the uh, putamen. And when we wanna to get to the globus pallidus, which is medial to the internal capsule, we've gotta slide in underneath the brain going above the carotid terminus into this place here around the anterior perforate substance to get in from underneath. So again, three different subtypes, three very different approaches, and this taxonomy takes you to that recommended surgical approach. Same can be said about thalamus. Here um, you see the six different uh, subtypes of thalamus uh, shown from above. And what you also see here is that each one of these has its own unique approach. It varies from a tra contralateral transcolossal transforaminal uh, 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 um, uh, approach here in, uh, in blue to these contralateral transcolossal approaches that go either above or below the fornix. Here's a uh, ipsilateral transcolossal approach to the superior subtype or choroidal subtype that just drops into the ipsilateral ventricle. For the lateral subtypes, we're gonna go transsylvian, but we're gonna have to move more posteriorly. So it's a posterior transinsular approach. And for those in the back, either pulvinar or in the geniculate bodies, you can see here, we're now choosing a supracerebellar approach that's either uh, infratentorial, paramedian here in blue to the pulvinar, or if we wanna go lateral into the gutter of the ambient cistern in orange, we're gonna go transtentorial and we're gonna go contralateral because as we start here on the opposite side and really angle over, it creates that crossing trajectory that gets us into this lateral space. Now for the midbrain, the same uh, conclusion is, is depicted here. Um, we have five different subtypes and five unique approaches. You can see um, two transylvian approaches, either interpeduncular to the um, interpeduncular lesions or transpeduncular to the peduncular lesions here in blue and, and red. For the uh, posterolateral lateral lesions in the pontine tegmentum, we choose this orange vector, which is a supracerebellar infratentorial lateral approach. For quadrigeminal lesions, you'll see we're choosing a straight midline approach, supracerebellar. And then for the periaqueductal lesions, top of the midbrain, <clears throat> we're coming down through the ventricular system, transcolossal, transcoroidal fissure. So there are your recommendations for midbrain lesions. For PONS, um, we've got six subtypes, six approaches. The Kawazi approach gets you to the basilar territory on the anterior or ventral surface of the PONS. These um, approaches through the uh, cerebellopontine angle um, are shown here. You can either go through the cistern in red to get to the peritrigeminal region, which is medial to the root entry zone of five. There's the trans-MCP approach, which is shown here in orange, which goes through the peduncle. And then if you look um, at this ghosted arrow below, we've got a far lateral exposure that comes up from below. That's that super olivary lesion <clears throat> that we talked about earlier with the sixth nerve palsy and the seventh nerve uh, uh, paresis um, that we go uh, to the underbelly from below. Um, the last two are either a um, transventricular uh, um, suboccipital approach for the rhomboid pontine lesions, or if it's in the inferior cerebellar peduncle, it's here to the side. Medulla, very similar. Uh, you can see the five lesions. We're either going far lateral to the front or we're going suboccipital telovelar to the back. Uh, and here's just uh, some examples to, to show um, how this works. So for this lesion here, uh, if you classify it as a putaminal subtype, you see the lesion here in the, in the putamen, you're gonna choose a terional anterior transinsular approach. Here's your craniotomy, here's your uh, exposure window, here's your target lesion, and this is the surgeon's view. You're gonna do a, uh, an opening of the operculum you're gonna get in between the M2 stem arteries of the candelabra. You'll get into the insular cortex 
And just through that insular cortex, you'll get to the putamen and you'll have at your cavernous malformation. Here's an example of the medial thalamic subtype. You can see from this illustration, it sits in this yellow zone on the inside uh, aspect of the thalamus or the lateral wall of the third ventricle. This is a um, gravity-assisted transcolossal approach through a bifrontal craniotomy. You can see the exposure you get here. And uh, this is the surgeon's view. After having opened up the foramen of Monroe, choroidal fissure, unroof the velum interpositum to get into the third, and there's your lesion sitting right on that medial surface of the thalamus. Here's an example of the peduncular subtype. So this is a midbrain subtype. It's in the peduncle. Um, we're going to go orbitozygomatic, transsylvian, transpeduncular. Here's our orbitozygomatic approach. It's the same approach you would use for a basilar apex aneurysm, which you can see right here, but we're going to take it lateral. So it's not the same as an interpeduncular because we're lateral to the third nerve. We're in the cerebral peduncle. We're underneath P2. We're above S2 of the superior cerebellar artery. And there's our entry zone into the, um, into the peduncle as it descends through the midbrain. And um, one more example here. Uh, this is the rhomboid pontine lesion, not an uncommon one. You'll see it come to the surface in the uh, back of the pons, uh, exophytic into the fourth ventricle. We're going to do a suboccipital crany. We're going to separate the tom tonsils to open up what I call the molecular triangle. And then uh, we're going to climb up into the ventricle above stria medullaris, out of the medullary zone, into the pontine zone, and we'll get to the lesion up at that height. So um, one of the concepts here is um, what I call the triangle concept. And um, what you're seeing in this is um, the, the taxonomy for the brainstem. You can see the three different types and the, the 16 different subtypes. And if, if you're thinking only about your decisions in terms of craniotomy, what you'll notice is that your craniotomy is not specific enough. That's this column here to, um, to tell you uh, exactly where you need to go for each of these subtypes. What you need to really be specific is not only a craniotomy, but an approach. And even one step further, a triangle. Um, and the combination of craniotomy approach and triangle is what takes you to exactly the right point or target uh, in, in the brain that you need to get to. And um, the analogy is if you're, if you're shooting a gun, <clears throat> you're going to aim it with not just one sight on the barrel, but two. There's a rear sight and a front sight, and it's the alignment of the two that creates accuracy. So the craniotomy is like the, the rear sight, the um, triangle is like your front sight, and the approach is the barrel, and you've got to get the three elements lined up to hit your target, and, and that's really the triangle concept. And so We've really um, gone through a lot of labor to um, lay out all of the different triangles that you'll see in the brainstem. Um, I won't go into the details. Uh, this is published already. Um, but you can see some of these are very familiar, like the carotid ocular motor triangle. Some of these are ones that we invented, like the vertebrobasilar junctional triangle. Um, some of these over here, like the um, supracerebellar infratrochlear triangle, um, the vago accessory triangle. These are things that are really not in the lexicon of neurosurgeons, but we've been trying to, to popularize this because it's, this triangle concept really is so important. And here, here's that triangle concept with the gun metaphor. You know, it, it's really a matter of lining up two sites front and back to hit your target. Um, safe entry zones are important because sometimes when you get there, uh, you're not always um, greeted with a lesion that's right there on the surface. So you have to be ready uh, to use a safe entry zone, you have to know where to make an incision in the brainstem safely and not get into a nucleus or a tract that's going to cause a deficit. Uh, and so um, there are 21 of these safe entry zones. It's really important to, to learn these if you're going to be operating on these. And um, once you are comfortable, then uh, you, you can pick and choose your way through. The arteries are another guide as you dissect. Um, this is just a table that shows all of the alphanumerics for the vasculature. We developed these because we wanted to come up with a, a better system for labeling bypasses. Um, the, the labels we use for bypass just aren't uh, detailed enough, so this was the purpose. But as it turns out, um, when you think about cavernous malformations, you can use arteries 
as a dissection tool. Uh, you can follow arteries to your targets just as you can follow um, these triangles and so forth to your targets. And these are just examples of the midbrain, the uh, 16 different subtypes. You can see each one has its own associated arterial target. And you can even de develop these what I call dissection codes where by jumping or leapfrogging from one segment of artery to the next, you can follow this pathway from the surface of the brain all the way down to your cavernoma target. And these are some examples. This is the intrabeduncular lesion. And if, if you think about the arteries that are gonna take you there, you start in the sylvian fissure, you get into the operculum on the M3s, you get down to your candelabra on the M2, takes you to the M1 down to the uh, anterior, um, or the C6 segment of the carotid artery. You need to follow the choroidal out to separate the temporal lobe, then you pick up PCOM. And finally, uh, you're back at the P12 junction and there you are in the interpeduncular fossa, just having followed the pathway of your arteries to get to your cavernoma. Here's another example for the peduncular. It's a very similar pathway. Uh, but these are, uh, again, more illustrations from my team showing how the arteries can be your best friend as you're working your way through the, the maze here and uh, can take you to the target. Um, so I'm almost at a half an hour. Just a, a couple more points. Uh, when it comes to heuristics or things that help you as surgeons in making good decisions, um, we put this out a number of years ago. This is a brainstem cavernous malformation grading system. Uh, I think it's useful. Um, it's been um, externally and internally validated um, by us and others. Um, and uh, what, what's nice about it, if, if you can remember this um, system, uh, it will predict your um, expected surgical risk, just like an AVM grading system. And it actually is laid out like an AVM grading system. If you find it hard to remember these five variables, and I do as well, even though I've made this, um, I, I think about it like Spetzler-Martin. If you think about your AVM grading system, which we all know by heart, it's size, eloquence, and deep venous drainage. And here are those three analogous variables, size. There's no eloquence in the... There's no part of the midbrain that's not eloquent. So it's really a matter of does it cross the axial midpoint or not? So that's your eloquence. And um, DVA, does it have a DVA or not? So there's your Spetzler-Martin embedded in here. And here's your supplemental uh, grading system embedded here at the bottom with age, with a split point at 40 again, um, with zero and two points assigned. And then um, age of hemorrhage, whether it's acute, subacute, or chronic. And th these are the point assignments. It's, it's a little bit more cumbersome than a Spetzler-Martin because there's seven different um, uh, grades for this. Uh, but here's the, um, the reason why it's of value. You, you can look at your outcomes either as absolute outcomes on the left or as relative outcomes on the right. And um, no matter how you slice it, what you see is that as the grade goes up, the expected outcome goes down. And um, what I use as my cut point is grade five. So anything five or less, I think is an operable candidate. Um, anything that's six or seven, I think is uh, a patient to be uh, uh, conservative with. So just like with AVM selection, this will help you um, make your picks. So um, that's the end of my talk. I, I think I'm just at about 30 minutes. I wanted to save some time for questions, um, but um, these are just some, some concluding thoughts. Um, this whole taxonomy, you know, people have told me uh, thank you very much, but this is too complicated and no one's ever going to remember this thing. Um, and that may be true, but um, if you just spend a little bit of time, um, I think it has some, some valuable uh, benefits. It will help you put together signs and symptoms that help you uh, define the subtypes. It's, it it kind of reawakens your med student interest in neurology, putting together these things and trying to you know um, solve these bedside puzzles. Um, so I think uh, acumen at the bedside has always been something that I've, I've valued. Um, next, um, and most importantly, um, it will tell you the optimum craniotomy. It's gonna tell you, you know, craniotomy, surgical approach, triangle, safe entry zone. They're just coming up with that one label for the lesion will give you all of this treasure trove of information. And ultimately, you know, the, the outcomes that you see with these patients, it's as much to do with our decision-making as it is with our technique. You know, if you choose the wrong approach to get to a deep lesion, you can, you can hurt somebody really quick. And so 
Um, it's, it's just as much about making the right decisions as it is about your hands or your technical ability. And very lastly, you know, I think um, if nothing else, a taxonomy gives us a, a, a way to communicate about these in the same way that we, when we talk about AVMs, we say a, it's a grade three, it's a grade one, you know, and that means something. It becomes a way for us to communicate with each other. And I think um, hopefully the same uh, will be true with this one. Um, I did want to go back uh, to this picture here. I said I would explain this in the end. Um, now that you've heard this lecture, what when you look at this, this is a map. And um, what you're seeing is all of the different subtypes color-coded uh, with the anterior ones, the anterior lateral ones, the posterior lateral ones, uh, and posterior all in the color codes. Uh, and you see medulla, pons, and midbrain. These red lines, these are your arterial trails or landmarks that you can follow to get to the, uh, the lesion. These uh, hexagons reflect the craniotomy that you select. The arrows are the different approaches that you take going from craniotomy into the subarachnoid space. Uh, the triangles, if you look um, really carefully, you can see these little triangle symbols here, and they'll tell you the triangles Oops, that you're going to see along the way. And then um, at the very end here, these little circular hash lines, those are your safe entry zones. So um, these are just, again, um, heuristics or maps that you can study. Um, if you like the outdoors and you like hiking on trails, you, you know how when you're planning, you, you, you pull out your map and you get excited and you work through um, how you're going to plan the day out. And I think the same is true with cavernous malformation surgery. You can pull out your map, you can put it all together in your mind. And I think when you um, then get into the operating room, hopefully you'll be a little bit better prepared. So with that, I'm going to stop and uh, thank you. I want to just uh, jump right in there, Michael, and say that's that's just an inspirational talk. It's, it's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, it's 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 the marriage of anatomy and just you know uh, unparalleled experience between yourself and and Dr. Spetzler, and, and it it does look initially complicated on the surface of it, but I think it really it's inspirational in that and that it shows you that with if you're willing to put the time in and understanding, it's just these these amazing secrets are revealed. And, and I think if you're not willing to put that time in, you you have no business here. Um, so really, thank you for that. It's just just exceptional. Well, thanks. I, you know, it's funny. Um, th there are a lot of people out there that are coming up with technology to um, take your iPhone, plug in your your patient's scan, and then have it spit this out. So it it may get very easy for us. But um, I've always been a purist, and I, I like. I like it better when we're actually um, using our brains and thinking this through, and um, you know, hopefully, people will will find this and engage with it. But it's it's a complicated little piece of anatomy, and uh, you know, if you're not willing to sort of understand it, I, again, I just, I, 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 I think that's the beauty of it. What attracts so many of us there in the first place is just how how incredibly elegant it is. Once once you sort of understand and find find a key that unlocks, you know, a little bit of understanding, and and you know the your cataloging of your work uh, to accomplish that is it's really it's really spectacular. And I'll stop now. I have no other dog in this fight. <laughs> well thank you. That means a lot. Steve, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I'll just jump in. Um Mike, that's amazing talk as as Cameron said, it's um it's just a great framework. Um, while uh, it's difficult to put all of that to memory, having kind of that as a reference for these cases that we we don't see every day, um, it's just a, a very helpful uh, re resource for us and our trainees. Um, a couple of questions. Did you notice over the time period that any of the approaches changed uh, for, for lesions in the same place? So was there a uh, kind of an evolution of the technique uh, between yourself and, and Dr. Spitz or even in, in your own practice. Uh, and second question, um, utilization of um, advanced imaging techniques like tra tractography, things like that. Often our radiologists tell us that the, the track signals are not that great because everything's been squashed or these very large brainstem cab males, it's not reliable. So two questions, one on evolution of technique and the second on advanced imaging. Yeah, so um, 
the the answer to the first question is yes there has been some uh shift in um the approach selection the best example is the um, the pulvinar of the thalamus and the back surface of the thalamus um dr spetzer did a lot of superior parietal lobule approaches um, that were transcortical they go through four centimeters of tissue i've never liked that approach um it's nice if you do it because you come into the atrium and you get this really nice top-down panorama of the thalamus um but um, I've evolved to what I call that uh, super cerebellar transtentorial approach that goes uh, from the back and gets up to the pulvinar and the geniculate bodies from behind. And that's nicer, in my opinion, because it, it's completely subarachnoid. There's no tissue violation. And, um, and, and now I, I, pr I pretty much approach all of those lesions through that one. And I haven't done a superior parietal lobule approach in quite a while. So that's an example of some evolution. The others um, um, have been pretty steady. Um, I would say that some of the earlier experience, we did some transpetrosal approaches with um, large skull base um, um, exposures, translab, for example. Um, but what he has learned and what I have followed is that the trans MCP approach does a much better job and it's a simpler operation to get to the central ponds without the need for ENT and a big aggressive drill out. So that's been another shift in approach. So those are two really good examples of evolution. Um, second question about tractography, uh, I agree with you. It's um, really um, not helpful because there's so much scrambling of the signal that um, th they're almost unreliable. I, I think there are some specific uses of tractography like a pontine lesion, trying to figure out where the corticospinal tract is pushed. Is it pushed to the front or to the side? You can answer some, some really basic questions like that. Um, so I do it anyways, but um, by and large, the signal breaks down at some point because um, the, uh, the lesion disrupts the fibers. There's just um, too much chaos in the signal and um, you can be very quickly misled. So um, <clears throat> I, I think um, uh, it's good to do it it doesn't hurt to look at the the information, but it's not always reliable. Right, and just to, to dovetail into that intraoperative neuro monitoring, um, what's your kind of take on uh, loss of signals and you know, when yeah. when do you quit? Because it, it seems as soon as you as you look at the brainstem with these things, the uh, the monitoring guy has a seizure. Yeah, well, um, I, I hesitate to say this because I know you're recording. Um, but I think that um, neuromonitoring has very little value. Um, we do it on every case because it's the standard of care and you can't not do it. Um, but you're exactly right. As soon as you get um, near the, um, well, the, the secret to, a, uh, to cavernoma resection is you get inside and you resect it from the middle and you pull it down on itself. But anytime you get to the edge and you're in that separation plane, you're always going to tickle the the things that they monitor with the neurophysiology. So it's going to change. So as soon as you're at the critical part, they're going to start having their seizure and um, the, the physiologist that is not the patient. And so um, they're going to tell you to stop, stop, stop. And that's exactly where you're at the heart of the operation, getting that separation plane. So uh, I've come to develop a blind ear to the, um, to the neurophysiologist. Um, I just wait for them to harp in. Um, and all they do is ruin the good mood that I would have had otherwise. <laughs> Great. Dr. Patel. Uh, hey, thank you, Dr. Lawton. Excellent talk. I just have two really quick questions. Um, you have to answer the first one, but when is the book coming out? And the second, the, uh, the second one is um, with the recent in vogue, uh, resection of, you know, uh, intratubal hemorrhages, you know, um, a lot of our colleagues around the country have started using tubular, you know, you know, resections and, you know, basal ganglion hemorrhages. And I wonder, you know, in your mind, or if you've done this in terms of just, you know, ICH resection using the similar techniques for, for, for some of these deep seated lesions. And, um, yeah. if that is something that I think may evolve or, or may make it, uh, you know, aside from cavernomas, ICH resections, another big part of the practice. Yeah. Well, so um, I think the beauty of the tube, <clears throat> and by the way, I do use the tube. I just did a tubular case this week. Um, the beauty of the tube is it protects the brain um, on the way to get to the malformation. So there's no question that it has value for that. 
Uh, the problem is that once you get to the malformation and you're doing all of that intricate dissection, working the planes, developing all of that um, separation, um, it's really hard working in that constricted tube to maneuver the way you would otherwise. And so um, you have a protective benefit and then you have a, a technical limitation. And so the net of the two is that I think it's more hindrance than it is help. Um, so for, for my um, cavernous malformation practice, I, I don't use tubes. Um, I just think that you sacrifice too much dexterity, maneuverability, um, fine dissection ability. It's a, it's a very critical parts of it. Um, and, and in most of these approaches I've shown you, you're choosing a subarachnoid pathway, not a transparenchymal pathway. So that protective benefit becomes a wash. So um, I don't really use it for these. Um, I do use it for ICH though, and I think it does have value for those because those are transparenchymal approaches. The uh, first question, you know, when is the book coming? Well, uh, there are two more papers we have to finish. Um, so um, uh, we're almost there. And then um, I thought I could just bundle all the papers together and wipe my hands of it, but it turns out that there's a, there's a lot of work that has gone into the actual assembly of the, uh, the manuscript. But um, I, I think we'll be done in two months. And then it goes to the publisher, which usually takes about six to nine months to produce and print. So I, I expect that um, we probably won't make it by the CNS, but we will make it by the AANS next year. Thank you. Dr. Lawton, if I could ask a question as well. I was wondering if maybe you could just touch a little bit on your thought process on um, when to operate on some of these deep-seated cavernomas in eloquent locations um, you know, based upon preoperative deficit or lack thereof or hemorrhage or lack thereof. Um, yeah. Well, I think the short answer is that um, um, if patients come in with incidental findings and they're perfect, then you're hard pressed to give them a benefit from surgery. Um, so I, I usually don't operate on the incidental asymptomatic cavernous malformation, but most of them don't present that way. They usually present after a first hemorrhage. Um, there's this dogma that says, wait for the next hemorrhage and um, do it then. I, I think there's, um, I've always been troubled by that because then you're subjecting a patient to another round of hemorrhage and deficit and potential morbidity. Um, and, and so um, I, I've struggled with that. What I do is um, when, they, when they present, I just put them through the grading process. And um, if they've got favorable features in terms of surface presentation, age, chronicity, all those variables we talked about, then I'll offer surgery at presentation after a, an initial hemorrhage. I don't have any um, marriage to this two hemorrhage um, posture. Um, so um, I think it more, more boils down to how safe you think you can do the surgery and get it out of there. So, you know, if it's a first time hemorrhage, it's in the, in the ponds, but it's on the surface and it's um, smallish, doesn't cross the axial midpoint, all those favorable things, then I offer it up and let patients choose uh, rather than wait for the second hemorrhage. Just looking at the chat, I think we're um, at the time when you said you needed to be gone. Yeah. Um, I really, uh, again, really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, great seeing you. And uh, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Yeah, well, it's great seeing all of you. Um, I like all the artwork on the walls and uh, happy <laughs> pages. It's great to see you guys again. And uh, uh, thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. All right. You take care. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Take care.